Good afternoon. I hope you've had a good lunch. I'm an economist, and I'm going to be talking about the global transformation. Because we're in the middle of the painful construction of a global market economy. And it began in the 1970s with the collapse of the old social democratic welfare states in the West. The Soviet Union ran into stagnation. China's Danway system was collapsing. And we had a neoliberal economics revolution. And this revolution put overall emphasis on GDP growth, economic growth, and the construction of free markets, and liberalizing finance. Finance was suddenly a power in the world. And of course, this revolution, which was led by some very strange people who had been renegades after the Second World War, people like Frederick Hayek, Milton Friedman, and a new breed of politicians, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, who implemented this new doctrine of neoliberalism. And it was essentially about free markets, deregulation, individualism, and competitiveness. But the problem was that after they had initiated this phase, it's a disembedded phase of the economy out of control of society, we then had a next phase in which we saw the developments of the most unfree market economy ever constructed. And I say that very purposefully, because what happened was a system of rentier capitalism developed, in which the returns to property, physical property, intellectual property, and financial property increased dramatically. And the most symbolic thing that happened relevant to the technology issues that we've been discussing today was the passage in 1994 of TRIPS by what became the World Trade Organization. TRIPS was the trade-related aspects of intellectual property. And what this effectively did was globalize the US intellectual property rights system so that patents became incredibly powerful. A patent gives the holder of a patent a guaranteed monopoly income for 20 years. Copyright gives a guaranteed monopoly right to income for the whole of a person's life plus 70 years. This is not a free market. This is a rigged market. In response, governments, and I noticed your Minister of Finance is still continuing this policy, a policy of subsidies, subsidies to capital. So we had competition between countries based on subsidies. Now, finance was powerful by this stage, and we had a new technological revolution led by electronics, information technology, and eventually moving into AI. And the combination of the new technologies and financial power and the intellectual property rights meant that we had a system of mega incomes for those who had the technologies. And it fundamentally changed the system of the global economy. The new model didn't pay any attention to income inequality. The apostle said income inequality does not matter. Only growth matters. And what this did, and very importantly for understanding where we are today, 
is it ushered in a new global class structure. A class structure which had a plutocracy at the top of people earning billions of dollars or whatever, mainly from rents, forms of property. Below them, an elite of multimillionaires, mainly earning from rents. And below them, a salariat, people in permanent employment with salaries and pensions and so on. When I was a student, we were told that that would be the majority by the end of the 20th century. But of course, it is shrinking. Below them is the old working class, the old proletariat that the welfare states were built for. But they have been shrinking. And it's below that that a new global class has developed. That class is the precariat. I estimate around the world that that accounts for something like 40% of the total. Below the precariat is an underclass, people who are rejects from society, every society has them, people dying prematurely in the streets that are outside the system altogether. But the precariat is the new dangerous class in the world in the sense that it is against rentier capitalism and it is also against the old welfare state, laborism with jobs and trade unions and so on. And you can define the precariat in four dimensions. People in the precariat are suffering today from unstable labor, insecure labor. They have to do a lot of work that doesn't get counted for labor. They get a lot of activities that they have to do in order just to survive. They also have distinctive relations of distribution in the sense that they have low and volatile incomes, no access to non-wage benefits, no pensions in prospect, and they're living on the edge of unsustainable debt. This is existentially frustrating, stressful. They are also the first mass class in history whose level of education, on average, is above the level of the jobs they can expect to obtain. Even if many of them have to have those levels of education to get those jobs. And finally, and most importantly, the precariat feel and are losing the rights of citizenship. They're losing civil rights, they're losing cultural rights, they're losing economic rights, and they're losing political rights because they do not feel that the politicians and the political parties are representing their interests. There's a very interesting cartoon by a famous graffiti artist called Banksy. Many of you may know him. And this sort of summarizes the situation of the precariat. Young people are told, follow your dreams. Cancelled, lost. That's how many people in the precariat feel today. Now, while the precariat has been growing, we moved into an era of what could be called polycrisis. There are many crises that are happening all simultaneously. There's the crisis of the environment. There's the crisis of pandemics. We've already had six pandemics this century. There's also the crisis of public health, a demographic crisis where fertility levels are falling and at the same time, deaths of despair, of stress, are lowering life expectancy, even in the United States, in Britain, and a number of other countries. And fundamentally, the most important thing that has happened is that we have moved into an era of uncertainty. Uncertainty means, for an economist, that you don't know the probability of being hit by a shock. 
You don't know the probability of being able to cope with that shock or being able to cope and recover from that shock. And fundamentally, if you're in the precariat, you feel fragile. You feel you've lost the sense of resilience, the ability to bounce back. Now, this situation is leading to something that is even more frightening in the sense that it's leading to a drift to political populism, nationalism, neo-fascist tendencies represented by the types like Donald Trump and my own ex-Prime Minister Boris Johnson who play on the fears and promise to bring back yesterday. They can't, but they play on demonizing the other the migrants, the refugees, some minority group. And we are in danger at the moment of that taking place at the same time as the geopolitical developments of this global transformation mean that the rising rentier state is China and the falling rentier state is the United States. And the United States is indulging in protectionism, more subsidies, to compete with China. China is having to respond. The tensions are mounting. And for a country like Korea, or even countries in Europe, we are sort of squeezed inside this tension. So we're in a crisis period politically and economically because the inequalities are growing. The insecurity is growing. The sense of disillusion and public health problems are growing. Anybody who pretends that everything is fine is a liar or stupid. And so we have a situation today when we have to ask, what is the next phase of the transformation and how can AI and the technologies of the world be harnessed to improve this? I would like to make a few suggestions as an economist because I think that we need a new form of economics paradigm as this conference, the term used for this conference. And I think the first thing that is needed by governments, by co economists, and by everybody is to redefine what we mean by economic growth. Economic growth is more than GDP growth. GDP growth was a concept started just before the Second World War as a measure of mobilizable resources for war. And we still use it as an index. The trouble is that GDP is a stupid measure that doesn't take account of unpaid care work, for example. A vast amount of care work is needed. It doesn't take account of inequalities. It doesn't take account of the environmental decay. It doesn't take account of these crises of social protection. So we need a new concept of economic growth. The second thing, and I think this is very important in Korea and in other countries, is that we need to revive the commons. The commons are what are owned by all of us. Nature, resources, our inherited wealth. And we have seen that being privatized and commodified. The term we use sometimes in debates is that the commons are the poor overcoat. They give informal protection to people. I propose that every country should establish a commons capital fund. Those who are making profit from taking the commons deserve to compensate those who are having to pay the price. We need a capital fund from which common dividends can be paid to everybody to give them a sense of security, a sense of belonging, a common property right, if you like. We also need to think about 
the blue commons, the sea, and all the resources of the sea. Because with the development of new technologies, more and more economic growth is going to be from the sea, not the land. Korea is one of those countries which has acquired ownership of a vast amount of sea. Your sea area, surface area, is 4.7 times as much as your land area. And the resources in the sea belong to every Korean. The minerals, the sand, the fish, whatever's in the sea. And the World Bank and others know that economic growth is going to have to come led by the sea. We need to take that into account. We need to realize that to confront uncertainty, you've got to give people a sense of ex-ante security. Ex-ante protection, not ex-post compensation like the old welfare state. That is why I've been advocating a basic income for many years, because people must feel secure in order to participate actively in a market economy. We also need to confront the downsides of AI and modern electronics technology. Everybody always talks about automation, removing people from jobs, machines taking over. But there is also a concept of heteromation. The technologies create more work for all of us. We do a lot of work for the big tech corporations. Every time we go onto our computers, we are helping supply them with money. They should pay because they're making billions from us just using our computers. Heteromation is a big issue. More sinisterly, the use of algorithms and AI is helping to develop the panopticon state. The panopticon is a concept from the 18th century with a picture of an eye looking down on prisoners. And the prisoner doesn't know who is looking and when they're being looked at. And therefore, they do what the eye tells them, even though nobody actually may be looking. The panopticon leads to discrimination and what I call the banopticon, making people so fearful, or if they behave in certain ways that can be strung together as indicating a particular character. If you join an NGO, or you join a trade union, or you join a feminist group, then an employer or somebody could take that into account and say, that's not a looking, good looking person. We need to confront that downside because there are great advantages in AI as we have been hearing today. And the last point I want to emphasize is that we need to promote a new type of working. Why do we make a jobs, jobs so important? Most of the most rewarding forms of work are commoning, caring, volunteering, ecological work. And here I call on your tradition, because as you all know, Korea was founded in BC 3333 on the principle of Hongik Ingan, spreading community is spreading sharing. And I think you have a chance to resurrect that spirit of Hongik Ingan because I think that's the future we want to promote. Thank you very much. But let me conclude. Let me conclude by saying that there's a wonderful poem written by a woman who said that progress comes from those who dream of the impossible not from those who are the slaves of the possible. We have to have a spirit of a new politics of looking for a future. Now I'd like to introduce the next speaker, who I've known for many years, since she was this high, I feel like saying. She's now a distinguished professor, Song Yun Lee 
I've always called her Sophia, so it's making it easier for an Englishman to call her by that, who's been doing a fantastic amount of very useful work on the subjects I've been talking about, and has just published an important book. So I'd like to introduce her now to come on stage.